Good afternoon. My name is Amy Corshaw and I'm the Staff Wellbeing Coordinator for Northamptonshire Healthcare NHS Foundation Trust. I'm lucky to be joined today by Dr Joe Brown, Principal Clinical Psychologist and Lead for Staff Psychological Wellbeing at Northampton General Hospital. Thank you for being with us today, Joe. Nice to meet you, Amy. Hi. Joe, I've got a number of questions for you. We have lots of staff members saying questions in, so if you're happy, then we'll get straight on to them. Yes, that's yeah. fine. Wonderful. Um, I've had a lot of feedback from our menopause um, staff peer support group from women who feel like they may be experiencing symptoms of anxiety and depression during mm -hmm. what they think is perimenopause or menopausal years. Yeah. Um, would you be happy to explain what that might look like, please? Yeah, absolutely. I think the experience during menopause of anxiety is the same as if it were anxiety at any other time, as probably your members have mentioned. So you might experience things like a dry mouth or a fast heartbeat. You might feel a little shaky or a little trembly. Um, you also might experience even blurred vision or even feel faint in the more severe anxiety experiences. And of course, you might have hot and cold sweats, although whether that's anxiety or just the menopause symptoms, it's hard to tell. Um, but there are also some psychological symptoms where you might ruminate or have worrying thoughts going round and round in your head, which can be really difficult to cope with. And also you might tend to fear that the worst might happen. So that would be the anxiety. Sorry. Sorry, that sounds a little bit like panic attack. Yeah, I mean, in the worst case scenario, that would turn into a panic. So you can have a, a lower level of anxiety that just might build and build, or you might have a panic attack that's more intense and lasts a shorter time, but feels worse, I guess. And that's when you begin to feel the worst happening and your heart rate really speeds up. But in the general experience of anxiety, you may just have the lower level symptoms for longer, um, or they may come and go. Sounds good depression. So depression, the usual symptoms you might expect would be um, a kind of lethargy and maybe more tired, difficulty getting up in the morning, perhaps difficulty sleeping, concentrating. And sometimes you can even have a type of restlessness with that experience. And then in terms of the psychological symptoms, I think the worst ones are you begin to notice all the negatives in your life. You might feel lower in confidence and think negative thoughts about yourself and even about other people in the world around you. You can begin to see everything, the kind of negative layer. Um, and I think one of the other symptoms people often talk about is not enjoying the things they would usually enjoy. So they all go and do something that they're so used to finding pleasure in and actually then coming away thinking, goodness, I didn't really enjoy that like I'd used to. I think that's one of the hardest symptoms, actually. Yeah, so that must have a huge impact. Yeah, I think it does, because I think when we find ourselves not able to do or not feeling like doing the things that we're used to just being able to do without thinking, it can really impact our not only our mood, but our quality of life, I think. So, yeah, it can be really impactful and it's something we really need to to notice because there are things we can do about it, of course. Mm -hmm. so do you have any sort of top tips on how people can cope with anxiety and depression? Yeah, I think so. So it's something I've worked with for many years. And I suppose over the years, the things I think people find most helpful, um, first of all, with anxiety, I would say, if you can try and find a breathing technique that works for you. So what a breathing technique will do is it will actually reduce the experience of the adrenaline in your blood. So the oxygen going in slowly and be, the carbon dioxide being blown out slowly actually breaks down the adrenaline in your blood. And what the adrenaline is doing is causing all of those difficult physical symptoms. So if you can find a breathing exercise that helps you do that, it can make you feel a lot better. And of course, if you feel physically better, then you're going to feel more able to cope. And these the breathing techniques I'm talking about, there are many of them on the Internet. and They're so different that you have to try a few to find one that suits you. And the most important thing about learning a breathing exercise is that it is a skill and it will take you time to learn it. So I would recommend learning it at your best time of day when you're least anxious until you feel you know it. And then you'll be able to call it in when you do feel anxious. So that's tip number one. Um, the second tip that I would suggest is to try and notice when you're, being, you're feeling anxious and try and um, see the difference between an anxious thought and your regular thinking. Because if you can notice the difference, you can then say, hmm, that's an anxious thought. I need to put that in perspective and not pay it as much mind and almost put it in its place, as it were. And if you can do that, then my third tip would be to having noticed that thing, I can leave that over there and actually I can just think about something else or try and focus on something else, depending on how anxious you feel. There's going to be more or less effort needed in that. Um, and then for depression, I would say. 
depression is uh, a tricky one because it, you're going to be feeling like not doing anything. And my top tips are going to be to try and battle that and to do things anyway, which isn't easy, but it is the best way to combat it, really. So first thing I would say is try to do something that you know you're going to get a little enjoyment out of each day. It doesn't matter how small or bigger, the bigger, the better, but it doesn't matter how small. Um, I would also say to kind of... Um, notice the negative filter in your brain so it's the same thing as with the anxiety your brain is going to be likely filtering out all the positive and only focusing on the negative so if you can notice it doing that and notice the positive that's the really helpful and finally my third tip for depression would be to try and do something that you feel is an achievement something like it can be as small as brushing your teeth or as big as dusting the house whatever your <laughs> sorry <laughs> they're very boring example but um, it, it's something um something that you feel you really wanted to get done but it doesn't matter if it's a tiny tiny thing it's just to feel that sense of achievement so they make sense have you got any questions on those I suppose <laughs> wonderful thank you and would it help maybe um I've, I've spoken to people recently about having a gratitude mm. book um I, yeah and writing down things that day something that's made you happy something that you or something that you've done that's made you proud I wonder if you were feeling like that and you could go back and yeah. read over those things would that be the same yeah Fantastic. That's great. Thank yeah, you. that would. Sorry, I think you cut out a little bit there. That would absolutely be helpful. Anything that helps you turn off the negative depression filter will be helpful. And it, and it can be whatever you need. And sometimes actually people have spoken to me about actually writing down all the negative stuff, maybe even in a diary and putting it away so they can leave it somewhere. So that it, whatever helps you notice the difference between the negative uh, negative drenched thoughts if you like and then the more normal everyday thoughts you can push the negative ones aside and look out for those positive oh that's brilliant so maybe start start journaling or keeping diaries mm -hmm. to notice these different might yeah. help to get it yeah. down Brilliant. Thank you. What we know about both the anxiety thoughts and the depression thoughts is they're automatic. So they come in without us noticing. So essentially, both of the tips that I've mentioned are really about us becoming more aware of those. So we don't get so affected by them and we can put them in a bit of perspective. Um, but as with the uh, practicing the um, breathing technique, it is a skill. So it's something to learn and to notice over time. And just practice, 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 practice. Yeah. Yeah, it's the same for all things with psychological techniques. I'm afraid they don't just come like that. Otherwise, I wouldn't have a job. <laughs> I'm all glad you have. Um, another big question and something that comes up a lot is a lot of women find themselves suffering with, I want to put away, brain fog. Um, yes. This is the common symptom, isn't it? This isn't that we're all going mad. Yes. It is. No. And I think it's really interesting because I didn't actually know so much about these cognitive symptoms of the menopause until coming into that stage of life myself as well. And I think it's really worth us talking about it as much as possible, because I think the brain fog and the cognitive symptoms, as I would call them, um, lack of concentration, uh, word finding difficulties, your memory it, uh, might feel not as good as it used to. All of those kind of things can really make us worry about what's wrong with us or what's happening. Or actually, we're all going through a normal life stage and it's a, a normal hormonal reactions. But I think in the moment and when it first starts, it's really hard to remember that, actually. Um, yeah, I know for myself, word finding, when that first happened to me, I was, goodness, what's happened? But as I've talked to people more, I found out more myself about the cognitive difficulties with the, um, the menopause, we find that these are all just normal symptoms that we're all going through. It's really helpful to share them and talk about them, I think, because we get a much better perspective then on what the menopause could be like for us all. <laughs> Absolutely, it's finding that comfort to be able to say to somebody as well, oh, hang on a minute, I've lost yeah. my words, bear with me. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. to me all the time. <laughs> yeah, 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 I think so. And I think it's when it, and I think when it first starts, that's the problem, isn't it? If we're not aware that that is a symptom of the menopause, that can be really worrying, actually. And when I was thinking about preparing for this uh, discussion, I also thought that the anxiety anxiety and depression not only might be caused by the hormones but might also be caused by some of the symptoms and the worry and the fear about what's happening to us so you've kind of got them coming in at two levels so it's really worth noticing and talking to others about them I think. Absolutely and I know I know it's come up in a couple of sessions that we've had where somebody at the end of the session has actually said oh, thank god I'm not the only person I'm, I'm not going mad so it's nice to exactly, hear that. Exactly yeah. Uh, yeah, it's exactly I, and it, yeah it's going, going to happen to us all. Natural. Yeah, and it's going to happen to us all, isn't it? It's a normal life stage. I, I also think it's helpful to um, 
see it as that it's a normal thing that we've all got to go through not terribly pleasant half the time <laughs> but it is a normal thing and we you know we have to manage it somehow so talking is one of the best ways I think absolutely I couldn't agree more fantastic um some staff members have shared quite recently about experience confidence issues whilst going through yeah. pro menopause menopause is, is that a symptom yeah. I think it's a secondary symptom. It's a consequence of everything that the person's going through. And really, everything that we've discussed before, uh, just in this short time, causes a lot of confidence if you're feeling anxious or depressed or you're worrying about physical symptoms that can cause a loss of confidence in and of itself so whether it's the the literal hormonal experience of the menopause causing a loss of confidence or actually just the way we worry about the symptoms either way it's very common for people to feel less confident because their body's not doing what it used to do and, and that is something that we are going to notice and worry about and potentially feel like we can't do things we used to be able to do um, and I guess with that loss of confidence being a normal experience, again, we just want people to talk about it. They'll find they're not the only ones, but it's very similar um, coping that I would advise for the depression to just notice you're kind of maybe doing yourself down and remembering to put it in that normal range of the you know just the life place that we're in. But I, I guess that at, at the age where you start to experience these symptoms, you Possibly you could also be looking at becoming a carer for your own parents. You might be with a bit of empty nest syndrome at home as well. So I guess there's a, an awful lot of changes going on. Yeah. Basically, yeah. and I would guess then obviously emotionally as well. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. I think at, at the point at which it might happen to you is a life stage where there's plenty happening anyway I mean I suppose we could say that about any time of life couldn't we but it, yeah all, all of it coming at this, if you do have an experience where you're starting in the perimenopausal phase and you've got a lot going on in your life it will you know that will also make it a little bit harder um, but as with every bit of advice that we've talked about talking about it is the main thing you can do to help because you'll um, find that you're not the only one you'll find lots of advice and help out there and I think that's the reason for us talking about it today is to help people feel like it's not just them Absolutely. I think to get the message out there that we can talk to each other is absolutely fantastic. Yeah. So thank you so much for joining us today. It's been really great to get some answers to some of the really popular questions and the really common questions that are coming up through our staff and um, through friends and family, I guess, as well. And hopefully this session has provided some reassurance to lots of people out there as well. So thank you. It's been my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Hello and welcome to, to our Menopause and You session. Uh, my name's Anne-Marie Dudley and I'm Health and Wellbeing Manager at Northampton General Hospital. And I'm very pleased to be joined today by Dr Katie Barber. So um, Katie, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, thanks Anne-Marie and thanks for having me. I'm Dr Katie Barber. I'm a, a GP first and foremost, but I have a, an extended role in menopause and gynaecology. I'm currently the clinical lead for the NHS Community Gynaecology Service in Oxfordshire, which is a sort of an intermediate um, women's health hub, I suppose is the best term. I work both across the NHS and privately as an accredited British Menopause Society menopause specialist. And last year I was elected to the Medical Advisory Council for the British Menopause Society. So part of my role is to ensure menopause care is delivered consistently and in an evidence based way nationally. Um, I lecture and teach both across the NHS and non-NHS organisations in the public and private sector as well. Wow, that's impressive. <laughs> Definitely. So thank you so much for introducing yourself, um, Dr. Barber. So, so I'm just going to, to launch into some, some questions that, that I have, if that's OK with you. So in terms of menopause, um, many people might not know what's happening to them and they might have noticed changes. And more often than not, the GP is, is often the first port of call. So what would be, would you say, um, how could somebody best prepare themselves um, for a menopause related appointment with their GP? Brilliant question. I think before we go on to what they can do to prepare themselves, I think the important thing is to highlight awareness of menopause because lots of people still okay. seem to think they've got to wait till their periods stop and they've got terrible hot flushes before they can go and ask their, their healthcare provider for some help. But a lot of women will experience perimenopause, which is mm -hmm. symptoms of your falling estrogen levels and, and essentially 
menopause is when our ovaries have run out of eggs and we don't produce lots of uh, estrogen, progesterone and testosterone, which we've done when we're all having regular periods. So those symptoms in perimenopause can be really quite intrusive for a lot of women. The difficulty is they really overlap with lots of other conditions, thyroid disease, depression, rheumatoid arthritis, you know, lots of very vague, non-specific symptoms. And for most women, it's really difficult to diagnose. So the thing I would say is if you think you've got a myriad of symptoms that could be indicative of perimenopause or menopause, write them down, first of all, Mm -hmm. because you often forget them, don't you? If you're in that 10 minute consult with your GP, it's like... Absolutely. It's gone. It's gone. (laughs) Exactly. And don't be frightened to put embarrassing symptoms on there. So lots of women will suffer with sexual function issues and vaginal dryness Mm -hmm. and soreness and pain during intercourse and urinary symptoms and prolapse. And they are intimate personal things and you might need to be examined. So it's very easy to say, I won't talk about those. I'll talk about my hot flushes, my sweats, my joint pain, my fatigue, my insomnia. So I feel comfortable talking about that. Think about what those symptoms. Use some screening questionnaires. There's a really useful green climacteric score that you can have a look at online. It gives you like mm-hmm. a little tick list. So you can then start adding them together and thinking, actually, this could be menopause. Read about menopause. I mean, there's some fantastic resources out there, aren't they? And we're all talking yeah. about it, which is great. So particularly, I like um, directing women to the Women's Health Concern. So this is the mm-hmm. patient arm of the British Menopause Society. They've got yeah. loads of help and advice sections in their uh, have help and advice leaflets in their fact sheet section, um, and they cover lots of different aspects of menopause. Things like Menopause Matters, Rock My Menopause. These are all great websites that you could look at. Um, and there's some fantastic books out there. We've got lots of very high profile media celebrities advocating, talking about the menopause. And often they've joined forces with accredited specialists like me to share the medical perspective. Yeah. So do your research. It often helps for some people to take somebody with you to the appointment. That doesn't have to be your partner. It could be your um, sibling, a friend, a relative, um, because there's a lot of information often to take in when we talk about menopause, not just listening to the person coming in with their menopause journey, but also the information that the healthcare professional is going to give them. So do all of that if you can. Oh, absolutely. That's some some great tips there as well. Thank you. Because it can seem quite daunting, can't it? So people would go in typically with with the odd one or two symptom, but they might not actually put that together and realise what's happening. So I think um, it's really good to to look at um, or to research some of those symptoms, but from from verified sources um, that you've just mentioned, which is fabulous. So thank you so much for that. And and also in terms of that appointment. So just making that appointment itself can seem quite daunting um, just going into the GP surgery. So I just wondered if um, what could somebody typically expect from from a GP's appointment? So what what types of things would you go through with them? Oh, everything from the symptoms they're getting to management strategies, risk factors. I think the key thing about menopause is it's a really great opportunity for healthcare professionals. Now, it's not always your GP. It might be the pharmacist. It might be Mm -hmm. the um, nurse practitioner. It might be the physician's associate. It might be the medical student. It might be the junior doctor in your practice. It's an opportunity to go through lots of long-term health risks and benefits of treatment options because For some people, it's the first time they're seeing their healthcare professional after many, many years. And things like making sure we've optimised risks for things like cardiovascular disease, dementia, stroke, diabetes, looking at blood pressure, looking at smoking, alcohol, weight management, all these things come into play. When I teach doctors and particularly junior doctors, it's often something I'll say that is difficult to achieve in a 10 minute GP consultation. It's going to be tough to get through everything. So you might find it's a an information gathering from your perspective, an information sharing from the GP or healthcare professional's perspective, and then go away and assimilate the information, think about options, and then come back for that option to be prescribed if appropriate. So Mm -hmm. 
I think it's quite reasonable to expect to be listened to. Your symptoms are evaluated and also your, your healthcare professional is going to make sure there's nothing else going on. Thyroid disease, right. for example, can strongly overlap with perimenopausal symptoms and your GP may want to undertake some investigations to make sure there's nothing else going on. Mm-hmm. Or if you've got a pre-existing medical problem, sometimes there's an overlap between that getting worse and menopause. So it's about making sure those other health issues are optimised as well as talking about menopause. But you should be getting an information uh, sharing appointment where you're getting uh, clear guidance about the hormonal or non-hormonal options that you'd like to try, the risks and benefits of different regimes, and then allowing you to make an informed decision about what you want to do. Menopause is great because it's not, I'm not dictating to patients what they should and shouldn't have. Um, yes. I'm really giving them the information so that they can go away and have a think about the options and then choose the rest, the right one for them. That's great. So really, so this, this appointment is something that you are, you're being listened to, first of all, which is very important. And, you know, sometimes more often than not, people aren't listened to. So to have that healthcare professional in front of you actually taking that time to listen to you, to explain things so that you know that you're not actually, you're not on your own, that this is normal um, and, and really what to expect. So that's great. So they'll be like looking at the bigger picture of what's going on for you, looking at your overall health, which is fantastic. So that's really good that that would be happening as well. Um, and also the fact that you mentioned that you can take somebody in with you, which I think is key, certainly if you're feeling rather anxious, you know, perhaps would, would you say could they take in a notebook with them to note things down? Absolutely. And I mean, you know, as a GP, we've got all these fantastic tools at our fingertips. I can text patients with website links and questionnaires and all sorts of different things, you know, risk benefit discussions, fact sheets. I can send that all through. Mm -hmm. And then I've then got the option of saying to patients, look, have this leaflet, have this information, have a look at this. I think the difficulty in the NHS is we're quite pressured with time. You know, I I would love to give all my patients as much time as they need in order to go through everything to the nth degree. And and time pressures often prevent that. So as doctors, we've got tools at our fingertips to then make the consultation as efficient as possible. So one word of advice to anyone thinking about going and seeking help is if you can use email consulting, maybe before that appointment to give the healthcare professional an idea of what you're coming in with. If you can complete a questionnaire and send it in and said, you know, I'm wanting to come and talk about menopause. I filled in this questionnaire. I've looked at these resources. This is what I'd really like to discuss in the consultation. You can focus that in. So it might be actually, I've decided I don't want to explore HRT. I want to come and talk to you about non-hormonal options and I'm worried about breast cancer risk or whatever, and then put Mm -hmm. that to your healthcare professional. Let them know, because it's really helpful from our perspective if you've got a specific agenda and you've got specific questions you want us to answer. But write them down, you know, put them on a piece of paper and get them answered. Brilliant. And I think perhaps if if people were able to identify some of their symptoms and maybe prioritise the top three, for example, and bring those in to, to the healthcare professional. And also, is would they be able to extend an appointment time if they wanted to? Could they, perhaps, I know the, the normal appointment time would be 10 minutes. Are they able to request a longer appointment if possible? They book a double appointment. I mean, certainly you can request it. Yeah, it depends on okay. the individual, individual practices. Okay. Um, it is it, something to ask your individual surgery. But receptionists in most GP practices will know exactly who in the practice has a special interest, particularly in menopause. And right. um, particularly if it's a complex scenario, it might be that actually if you've sent an email saying you'd like to talk to somebody about menopause, that's already been triaged and you've been booked an appointment with the most appropriate person. And it might mm-hmm. be that that person has a slightly longer appointment. Um, sometimes the trainees in general practice, the ones that aren't quite fully qualified as GPs but have done extensive experience in in lots of different hospital specialties and general practice training they often mm-hmm. have slightly longer appointments because they're still in that learning mode you know supervised yes. by a senior doctor so those appointments can be really useful to give patients a bit more time but ask and and don't feel you need to have everything tied up after 10 minutes you know if it mm-hmm. is I'm not really sure what I want to do feel confident to say I'm going to go have a way and think about this and then can I come back and have a bit more of a discussion with some more questions when I've decided what I want to do? Brilliant. Thank you. I know you've touched on some of the, the different approaches and um, I know that some of our viewers might not know necessarily what those approaches are. Are you able to, to, to 
talk through some of those if possible like treatment options yeah. for menopause uh, you're yes, talking about. Yeah, different, yeah, yes yes definitely yeah. so pretty much these fit into i would say lifestyle non-hormonal prescribed treatments and hormonal prescribed treatments so i'm going to harp on about lifestyle in this talk it's um it's right. so important so not only is lifestyle optimization really important for long term health it mm -hmm. also plays a role specifically in managing menopausal symptoms so we know that people who drink excessive alcohol who smoke who have too much caffeine women who are obese are more likely to suffer intrusive menopausal symptoms so flushes sweats insomnia mood change can be significantly worse and clearly if I said to a patient, you need to stop smoking, give up alcohol and lose weight, that's really unsupportive. And, and they're often in quite a difficult place where these things are compounded by awful menopausal symptoms. So it's about saying, let's get the menopausal symptoms optimised and then we can do the lifestyle modification and it should run hand in hand. Mm -hmm. So all those things can come into play, making sure you eat healthily, look after your, um, your exercise and do regular exercise things like optimising your bone health. So that's not just weight bearing exercise, but making sure things like vitamin D, calcium intake are optimised, um, minimising alcohol if you can. We know that that's a terrible trigger for insomnia and particularly for things like migraine and, and, and mood change. So addressing all of that is key. So that's the bit that you can do to support yourself, healthy lifestyle. Then you've got the sort of hormonal and non-hormonal prescribed treatments. Now, NICE guidance from 2015 says that for the majority of women, uh, HRT is the best option to improve menopausal symptoms. There are clearly women in whom HRT would not be appropriate, and they tend to be women who've had hormonally driven cancers. So most types of breast cancer, some types of ovarian cancer, and some types of endometrial womb lining cancer. And that's because if we give estrogen to those women, it increases the risk of that cancer coming back. But for the majority of women under 60, the benefits of HRT far outweigh the risks. And then we're talking about giving hormone replacement therapy, HRT. And there's three hormones that make up HRT, estrogen, progesterone and testosterone. And the combination you have depends on lots of different factors. And for most women, that will be really effective, particularly the estrogen element, at eliminating menopausal symptoms. So that can improve the sweats, the flushes, the mood change, the joint problems, fatigue, insomnia, vaginal treatment. So that could be some local vaginal estrogen rather than the systemic HRT tablets, patches, gels, etc. Mm -hmm. So that's one of your options. And then you've got the non-hormonal prescribed treatments, and they can be medication that typically we use for other conditions like antidepressants. I'm going to say that word because I know lots of people think that actually I was given antidepressants, but I'm menopausal. But for women who've had yes. maybe breast cancer, um, low dose antidepressants provide benefit for flushes, severity, frequency. They can help improve sleep. So we use treatments that maybe have the main use for something else that can actually be used to treat menopausal symptoms where HRT may not be the most appropriate option. So that's kind of the different things we talk about. We also know that cognitive behavioural therapy can help in managing symptoms like insomnia, mood change, flush severity and frequency. So we use those sometimes as well. Brilliant, thank you. So, so much to think about, isn't there, when, when you have this appointment and you have this chat. So there are different options available for everybody. So that, that could be hormonal, non-hormonal, lifestyle, which of course lifestyle you can then um, incorporate within whatever it is, whichever option it is that you take. So so that's that's wonderful to hear. And I know that um, certainly some of the workshops that I deliver, a question I get asked quite often is how long could somebody take HRT for if they were looking at that route? Uh, there is no arbitrary time limit is the answer. Um, mm -hmm. We we know that in women under 60 using HRT, there's additional benefits to HRT in terms of bone density. So mm -hmm. we have a lower risk of osteoporosis if we use HRT and lowered risk of cardiovascular disease. That's things like angina and heart attacks. In women over 60, we would advocate HRT continuing for women in whom they get benefit for symptoms. So it's more for quality of life in women over 60, but we don't set a time limit and say, oh, you're now 60, you must stop. 
Okay. Clearly, ongoing use of hormone therapy should be reviewed, updated, and we should be looking for new medical conditions in that patient that might change the regime, the type of HRT we're delivering and how long women use it for, or whether it's safe to continue. But just saying to women, you're now of this age, you must stop is no longer applicable. It's dependent on the symptoms and the quality of life improvement that women are deriving from their hormone therapy and their choices and safety in terms of continuing. Excellent. Thank you so much for covering that. I know that there's a lot of people that do do need, want to know that answer. So thank you very much for that. Um, I know as well that there's been a lot of talk about some people do get referred on to specialist menopause clinics. Um, would that be something that a GP would have to refer somebody for? And in what sort of instances would that be that somebody would be referred to a, a specialist clinic? So I run a specialist clinic in the NHS and also work in a specialist clinic privately. There's a slight difference in that often women will self-refer to a private specialist like myself just because they want a more detailed in-depth discussion with more time to explore their symptoms and concerns. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the benefit of having that specialist knowledge. We can really go into great detail with patients. So in my specialist clinic privately, I see your standard menopause patient who would have ordinarily gone to a GP, but just wants a bit more time and a bit more understanding. But equally, mm -hmm. I see more complex patients. And in the NHS, particularly, a lot of menopause can be easily managed in primary care. But women under 40 with menopause, what we call premature ovarian insufficiency or premature ovarian failure, it's, they often need further investigations or specialist monitoring to make sure that long term health risks are minimised. It might be that we're seeing women in specialist clinics who've had cancer. It doesn't have to be breast cancer. It can be lots of different types of cancer. And it, it's where maybe the primary caregiver in, in general practice doesn't feel confident in prescribing because they're not sure about safety. Um, likewise, prescribing for people with maybe stroke or heart disease or pre-existing conditions might come through a specialist or women who are using medication that might affect HRT. So there's lots of complex scenarios. We also see women in specialist clinics perhaps that um, are on HRT or on a treatment and it's not working or there's a complication or a side effect. And there's that need to sort of say, I'm not sure what to do next. I'm going to ask for specialist help. That, that's great thank you so much for that but that's that's really useful with people certainly with more complex issues um surrounding menopause as well so thank you very much we're sadly coming towards the end of our session i'm just going to to very quickly ask you if that's okay what three top tips would you give to somebody who's going through menopause? do your research and get some information about how you're going to manage this best. No two women are the same. So it's not a case of HRT for everybody. And it's not a case of you need to just manage this yourself. It's does, does your menopause affect your well-being? Ask for help is the first thing and do your research. So two things there. The third thing is balance risks and benefits of treatment. Um, there's a real um consistency in the attitude towards HRT in terms of breast cancer risk still I think lots of women were frightened 20 odd years ago about the data about breast cancer risk but for most women under 60 the benefits far far outweigh the risks so do your research don't be frightened to ask for help and balance risks against benefits so that you're making an informed decision for yourself Fantastic. Thank you so much I, I think I, I might add a tip in there as well for somebody just to say don't wait till things get too bad and unbearable. Just please, please do something and seek some help. But thank you so, so much for, for joining me today and for your time. I really appreciate that. And I hope that that helps um, our viewers as well. So thank you so much, Dr. Barber. Thank You're you. welcome. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Hello, my name is Sarah Faraday and I'm Acting Health and Wellbeing Manager for Kettering General Hospital. Welcome to our Menopause and You session and I'm very pleased to be joined by Nigel for our session on Menopause and Nutrition. Nigel, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Yes, thank you for having me, Sarah. I'm Nigel Denby. I'm a menopause dietitian and I've been supporting uh, women through menopause for the last 20, 25 years. I'm also the founder of HarleyStreetAtHome.com, which is a support community for uh, people experiencing perimenopause and menopause. 
Wonderful. I'm so pleased to be joined by you today. I think this is going to be a really interesting session. So um, there's so many myths about nutrition and so many fad diets and there's all these latest crazes about, you know, all sorts of different fads, quick kind of fixes. Why? Um, what's what is what would you say new, good nutrition is? Because I think it, there's so many myths out there. Well, absolutely. I think, you know, food plays such an important part in our lives, in our health. Food, first of all, is a pleasurable aspect of living. We all love different types of food. It's a very social thing. It's providing also nutrients to serve all our, the various different elements of our health. And of course, um, and probably the thing we think of the most, uh, particularly around perimenopause and menopause, is that food has a huge influence on our weight. So many women experience weight gain at the perimenopause and menopause, and often food can become the enemy. And that really is the last thing I would ever like to see happen. And it really doesn't have to be that way. I mean, that's just so important to highlight, isn't it? Thank you. Um, so why do you think particularly around perimenopause and menopause, um, new, good nutrition is, is so important? Well, there are several things going on. So nutritionally, um, when you experience perimenopause and menopause, the symptoms that you're experiencing are all dragged down to changing levels in your hormones, predominantly estrogen. Oestrogen has a huge impact also on protecting your body from heart disease. As you lose your oestrogen or your oestrogen levels reduce, the flexibility of blood vessels and the arteries leading to that and away from the heart all begins to change. And women's risk of heart disease increases to the same level as a man's, if not a little higher. Um, so that has huge implications from a nutrition point of view. Also, as well as heart disease, bone health comes into play when we think about menopause. And again, the density and the strength of the bones begins to reduce um, more quickly as your oestrogen levels begin to fall. And again, nutrition has a huge part to play there. But to be honest, Sarah, the reason when women come to speak to me, they don't come asking about heart health or bone health. They come because they're gaining weight. And on average, we know that women gain around about a kilo and a half for every year of their perimenopause. On average, that means about 10 kilos, a stone and a half gained over the whole of the perimenopause. Now, if you're a five foot four, five foot five woman, that's a dress size. Um, that's a significant amount of weight. And generally speaking, that's what is, is really bothering women. The, the key there is to then finding a solution to help manage the weight, but also look after the bone health, look after the heart health. It's why fad diets, quick fixes some of the diets you might have used in your 20s and 30s are absolutely not appropriate now absolutely it's such a minefield though isn't it i mean where where would you suggest starting because i think you know in covid as well it's been really challenging you know there has been the tendency perhaps to kind of eat the wrong things or to um, indulge in things to try and comfort ourselves so where would you eat where how do you even begin to start to look at good nutrition or improving your, your nutrition well, I think you've kind of got to start looking right under your nose at what it is you do right now. I wouldn't suggest jumping onto any sort of a diet that you see on social media or that you see a celebrity doing. These sorts of diets are usually um, designed to give a quick result. And more often than not, they'll lead to weight regain, which is even worse news when we think about perimenopause and menopause. I think, first of all, we've got to understand what's going on to cause that weight gain. There are really three factors that make it a perfect storm for weight gain at perimenopause. As your estrogen levels reduce, that changes the way your body lays down fat. You're going to start laying more fat down around your abdomen, your trunk, your waist. You might notice your bra doesn't fit as well. Um, it all seems to be around your tummy um, and your back. 
That is because oestrogen was giving you previously that nipped in waste. Um, and as you lose your oestrogen, you begin to lay fat down more like a man would. So you become more straight up and down. The oestrogen reduction is not causing the weight gain. It's changing where the fat is laid down. But there is something else going on as well. We're all men and women. We start losing muscle tissue from the age of about 30, 35 through the normal process of aging. We know that when, as women go into perimenopause, they lose muscle tissue a little bit more quickly. And that's slowing your metabolic rate down. That's what causes the weight gain. You need fewer calories. The other part, though, which is the harder part to face, I guess, is thinking about What's your part in this? There will be habits that you've picked up. Most people are not gaining weight at perimenopause because they're eating pie and chips every night and drinking six pints of lager. Most people have begun to get a pretty good idea of what's relatively healthy. What we tend to see is small habits that were picked up again in the decades before are now beginning to catch up with you. So larger portions than you really need to eat, perhaps relying particularly after lockdown on alcohol and drinking alcohol a bit more frequently, grazing. So you're not necessarily eating proper meals, but you're consuming high amounts of calories by almost unconscious eating that goes on between meals or when you've left it too long without eating and you're really hungry and you find yourself at the fridge and have a bit of cheese or let's have a bit of ham and oh with some crisps and the next thing you know without having a proper meal you've consumed you know a thousand fifteen hundred calories and it's these discrete things that are often part of the jigsaw. So what I usually suggest people do is keep a food and activity diary for three or four days. That's going to really let you see. You've got to do what you normally do, but it's going to let you see what's going on. And you'll probably highlight two or three things that are um, the key things that need to change. Of course, it's not all just about your diet as well. We've got to think about movement and exercise. And I would really suggest that if you've managed your weight previously just by dieting, this is the time to begin to think about doing more steps, more aerobic exercise, bringing in a little bit of strength exercise. You don't need to go to the gym. You're not pumping iron, but this can just be using your own body weight as resistance and doing things consistently. It's what you do every day that has a much bigger impact than what you might do one or two days a week. <clears throat> it's so interesting what you're saying, Nigel. It feels like some small kind of changes or some small regular habitual patterns can really, in a positive way, can really help our health and, and, and our nutrition. Um, in terms of benefits, you were saying, it, you know, this isn't a quick fix and, you know, we're, we're not looking for those fad diets that are going to suddenly give us those quick results. But what are the benefits that we might see from improving our nutrition? Are there some short term benefits? Are there medium oh. and long term? 100 percent. So if you I mean, what I normally do is we start thinking about let's aim to reduce your weight by about 10 percent of your total body weight. So if you weigh 90 kilos, let's look at a reduction of about nine kilos. That 10 percent body weight is going to help reduce your if you've got high blood pressure, it will reduce that. If you've got high cholesterol, it will help reduce that. It will reduce and help you manage your insulin sensitivity much more efficiently. It will reduce your risk of cancer. Every health benefit that you can think of can come from just a 10% weight loss. The other thing though it can do, I often think menopause can really leave you in a place where you feel as if you don't quite know who you are anymore. And that, you know, life is going a little bit out of control. What I really love to see with the women that we work with uh, at Harley Street at home is actually you getting that control back. We've worked with just now over 1300 women through our Back to Basics program, which is a really simple 12 week look at managing your diet, your lifestyle. Um, and what everybody is expecting is to have to go on some crazy, really tough, hard diet. You don't need 
to do that, you're looking for about a three to 500 calorie a day deficit of from where you are at the moment. That's quite simple. Those are really small thing changes, slightly smaller portions at meals. I often look, look at your plate, try and balance it into four quarters. You want one quarter carbohydrate, one quarter protein and half that plate, fruit, vegetables or salad. If you do that at breakfast, lunch and dinner, that's always going to keep your nutrition right. It's going to look after the vitamins and the minerals. If you then look at your plate and try and imagine, would it fit into your cupped hands, the food on that plate? That's about the portion that you need to feel satisfied. Now, if you have planned, sensible snacks mid-morning, mid-afternoon, although that might be smaller than you normally eat, with those snacks, with regular eating, you'll be amazed at how often that amount leaves you feeling satisfied. It won't always. If you've done a lot of exercise the day before, you might find you're a bit more hungry that day. But generally speaking, reducing those portion sizes, keeping an eye on the unconscious grazing, deciding, I, you know, I really love my glass of wine or my gin and tonic. I'm going to have that on a Friday and a Saturday. I don't need to have it the rest of the week. Those sorts of things combined with some extra steps, a little bit of strength exercise is the perfect recipe for lifelong weight management. And that's the thing here, Sarah. Whatever choices you make about your lifestyle now are going to see you into the decades ahead of you. I'm all about women looking at you when you're 85 and thinking that's the woman I want to be. And it's the choices that you make now that will really have an impact on that. That's really interesting, Nigel. So it's almost like trying to future proof our own health, really, and yeah. making those small changes um, over a prolonged, consistent period of time. But it is nice to know we can have the odd occasional treat because some diets seem like they're almost punishment. And, you know, really, that's not much fun, is it? So I, I guess we want to really make make this kind of accessible and make sure that we can have those meals out with friends and socialise and do the things we want but all in I guess in balance and moderation really. You've got to learn how to enjoy indulgences uh, for what they are and thoroughly enjoy those you know you're this is a lifelong lifestyle plan we're really talking about not a diet a diet has an end point this is something you're going to need to do forever because the reality is you're going to be a menopausal woman for the rest of your life. Whatever you do to manage your weight now, you're going to need to do for the rest of your life. So it might as well be something that you can do. If it's purgatory and misery, you're never going to see that through. And you really don't have to because, again, the changes I'm talking about and the changes the evidence shows us work, you know, uh, are really quite gentle. You don't need to go and do keto or intermittent fasting or continuous glucose monitoring. These are all, you know, fad, fashionable diets. They're not based on evidence. Good evidence and good sustainable weight management is achieved through eating well, eating foods from all of the food groups, eating regularly throughout the day, balancing your food groups and moving. You, the moving is non-negotiable. We've got to get more active. Mm. It's really interesting because it feels like this is really kind of what we do in our workshops when we run menopause um, awareness workshops, that actually it's about a holistic approach. So you can't just use one element and then not do other things. So this is kind of a holistic support to really looking after ourselves during menopause. I'd like to ask Nigel, what about supplements? What's your view on multivitamin supplements? You know, I've heard yeah. so much about collagen, B, vitamin B12. You know, what what are your kind of thoughts and where do, where would we start? Can we buy over the counter multivitamins? Is there benefit in those? So in terms of a supplement, every woman 
ought to be taking a vitamin D supplement, especially during the winter and autumn months. 10 micrograms or 400 international units a day is all you need. That's just an off the shelf from Boots, Superdrug, Tesco's, anywhere you like. Nothing fancy. If you wanted to take a, a good quality multivitamin and mineral as an insurance policy to a healthy diet, fine. Otherwise, the only reason you take a multi, you take any kind of supplement is where there's a clinical need. There are very, very poor regulations about vitamin and mineral supplements, very little evidence supporting them. So very often you don't know what you're taking, whether it's got the amount that it's meant to do. And really um, very little evidence to show that there will be any great benefit from them. Again, it's often much easier to take a vitamin and think, wow, that's really going to help me with my energy levels, when the reality is your energy is in the boots because you're eating garbage. If you can look at a more um, grounded way of managing your nutrition and supplements, that is a much better approach. But you're oh, right, good. you know, you can only really start addressing your lifestyle once you've got your symptoms under control. What I ask people to do, changing their behaviours, is often harder on some levels than doing a quick, short diet. You've got to be feeling on your A game. You've got to have some self-worth. You've got to have some motivation to do that. And that is difficult to find if you're on your knees with symptoms. So take it a step at a time and also know you have got the rest of your life to get this right. You don't have to do it all this year. I've got people who work with us on our Back to Basics program. They've been doing it for four years. They come back each year and they say, right, I've got all my portions sorted. I've got my alcohol sorted. I've got my steps in. This time I'm back to do my strength and really get that right. And you can build on this as you go. It's a lifelong approach. That sounds so much more achievable, though, than trying to kind of address every single thing that we want to do with all in one go, because then it feels almost overwhelming. And then it, I kind of I kind of feel like from my own experience that I would want to then say, oh, I'm just going to give up on all of it because it's too much to cope with. Yeah, um, what li women's lives are busy enough. You're spinning yeah. enough plates. You can't do all of this in one go. Hmm. I mean, I know we're going to come on to res some resources in a moment for, for ladies that um, and colleagues that want to contact you. If you could give three top tips, what would they be? I know that's probably really no, no, difficult no. to narrow it down fine. to three. First thing I would ask you to do, do your food and activity diary. If you've got kids, when you look at your diary, think to yourself, would I be happy if my kids ate and drank like I do? If the answer is no, find the reasons what it is that, that you would want to change. Next thing, look at your daily routine and see where you could find 15 minutes for some more walking, simple walking. That would be the, the next thing. And lastly, do not be jumping on and off those scales. Look at, use your clothes to see how you feel. A button up shirt and a pair of trousers that are on the snug side will tell you everything's moving in the right direction. Do not be a slave to the scales. That's really comforting to know. Thank you. Um, I really enjoyed this session with you today. It's been absolutely brilliant. I know it's been a real bite sized session. So could you just let us know if people do want to contact you afterwards, how they would go about doing that? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And thank you so much for having me. The festival is a real triumph. Well done. Um, yeah, if people would like to find out more about Back to Basics, more about Harley Street at Home, just come to harleystreetathome.com. We're going to pop a card on at the end. At the moment, You can everybody can join us for 30 days free of charge. Just see if you uh, like what we do. Our subscription is £19 a month um, and uh, you then have access to everything that we offer our master classes our exercise classes courses programs and of course our back to basics nutrition and weight management course but 30 days free of charge give us a try um, and you'll be able to contact me there brilliant thank you so much for your time Nigel this has been really I found it personally really interesting and the top three tips that's given me a bit more motivation to get started and get moving a bit so thank you it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me, Sarah. Brilliant. Thank you.